morning, Anita. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome, Ken. I thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. We're, um, we particularly appreciate you being here. It's such a busy time for Huawei at a time when Huawei is, is very much in the news. Um, we're, we're glad you're here. We, um, we want to understand what 5G means because it's going to mean a big change in all of our lives. Uh, you, Huawei uses the expression, the smarter future, when talking about 5G. What do you mean by smarter here? Yeah, I mean, I think we are already in a smarter world. And from my point of view, the, the smarter world featured by three key mega trends. Everything will be sensing, everything will be connected, and everything will be intelligent. And driven by those you know, three key uh, mega trends, we've already seen a lot of you know, exciting changes as individual consumers and, and business. So like the medicine, you know, now globally, there are around 90 million children with eye problems. It's quite hard for the doctors to de detect this disease at an early, early age. You know, now we can use a smartphone and artificial intelligence to let the children look at the screen to follow the objects on the screen, and the, art and the AI functionality can help to de detect the problem and help the doctors to provide the early diagnosis and the early treatment. So this is quite meaningful. And here in, in, in France, French people produce lots of wine every year and they're quite busy in the peak season, and now we can help them to use the artificial intelligence and the satellite image to identify which group should be ready for harvesting. So in the peak season, that greatly helped them to save the time and produce better wine, which is really good for us. So all those exciting changes are basically enabled by a set of uh, emerging technologies including the 5G, the 5G Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and probably the blockchain. And among those you know, uh, set of technologies, 5G is a key enabler to support all other technology to maximize their, their potential. So we can see 5G as a you know, farmland and it will help all the, you know, all the other vertical, uh, all the other, you know, uh, digital technologies to, you know, realize the big potential for the, for various, you know, applications. So I think our I think our work is actually done here because you've explained why this is important for wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, talk about so Huawei is in an interesting position now. For decades, it was a uh, an equipment manufacturer, now it's also a consumer company itself. You're the largest cell phone uh, company in China. Um, what are the consu how will consumers' lives change from 5G? Yeah, the 5G has great potential for both consumers and uh, business. Yeah, I've, been using, uh, yeah, I've been using my uh, latest uh, 5G smartphone in China for a couple of weeks, because uh, the service was announced at the, at the end of October. And I found that it's, it's super fast. Now I can download a high definition video to the smartphone in just uh, one minute. And with the 4G network, it takes 10 minutes. So it's super fast. But 5G, for the consumer, 5G is not just uh, a fast 4G. Actually, 5G can help us to create some brand new user experience. I visited. Uh, South Korea at the beginning of this month. And in South Korea, there is a brand new broadcasting service called the 5G supported broadcasting service, which is a little bit boring, but the experience is amazing. Now in South Korea, yeah, I tried that. I, I use my 5G smartphone. I can look at the sports game from any angle I want, 360 degrees. So that's cool. Yeah, that's a brand new experience. That's a totally immersive experience. So it means a lot to the consumers, faster speed and brand new user experience. Can you give us a rough sense of when the whole world will experience 5G? What, what, what a small percentage of the world is experiencing, is experiencing it today, is that right? Yeah. How many years will it be before it's the dominant technology? 
Yeah, so far, uh, there are 20 countries uh, launching the 5G commercial services already. So um, the progress of the 5G deployment is much faster than we expected. Let me share with you some figures. With 4G, it took four years to achieve 700 million subscribers in the whole world. But with 5G, we believe that we'll be able to achieve that in just two years. So it's, it's much faster. And uh, yeah, let me share with you a map. So where is the map? Yeah, let me share with you a map. Yeah, from that, you can tell that um, South Korea is the you know, first country launched the 5G service. And uh, after South Korea, China, uh, United States, uh, countries in the Europe and the, in the Middle East are all the earlier adopters. Yeah, you don't see China on this map because uh, China announced the service at uh, October 30, so 30th, and this map was uh, finished at, at the middle of October. But China is obviously one of the you know fast mover in in 5G, and for the for the for the for the short term, we expected that to the end of next year, in just one year, we're going to see 60 country. Uh, launch their 5G services. And for your question, for the, for the longer term, we expect that to the end of 2025, 58% of the world's population will be covered by 5G services. 58%? 58%. By the end of 2025? 2025, yeah. Good. Now, you, you believe, Huawei believes that the 5G will help advance the cause of digital inclusion. What, what, what does this mean? How, will, how is 5G different from previous cellular technology in that regard? Yeah, 5G can help a lot on individual consumers' experience and on the you know, business operation. And uh, yeah, at Huawei, we identify that, you know, there are three key gaps we need to deal with in terms of the digital inclusion. Because while we are trying to introduce, you know, the emerging, uh, the, 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 the emerging digital technology to make our lives easier, we still have lots of people left behind. And we think that's not right. We have to deal with some gaps. The connectivity. Uh, now there are around half of the world's population has no access to the internet. This is a big challenge. And we believe that you know, help can help can can help us on that in, in a certain way. And uh, the second gap is the application. Yeah, you know, I visited a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago, and I talked with you know his parent, showed them my latest smartphone, and they said, "I can. This is fantastic, but but I don't like it at all. The why? Because yeah, we don't know how to use it." It's too complicated for us. Mm. And uh, yeah, we couldn't even you know, get around the city because now taxis were always booked by the mobile applications. So we all have you know, parents and grandparents. That reminded me that you know, while we're trying to you know, move in so fast into the digital world, some people are left behind. So, so we, we, we need to make some change. So to fill the gap of connectivity, to help the, the other you know, half of the people to get access to the internet, and to develop more applications for, not just for us, but also for a special group of people like our parents or, and, and our grandparents, and particularly to enhance the digital skill. Yeah, the figure we observe is that in European Union, 90% of the job, by the year of 2025, 90% of the job will require digital skills. However, the fact is, today, there are around 47% of the EU residents has very limited skill, uh, digital skills, like you know, searching on the website. So, so we need to do a lot to you know, fill the gap and to improve the digital inclusion. And yeah, 5G can help us a lot on that, you know, connectivity, enhance the skills, yeah, to give us more you know, uh, technology, stronger te technology to promote the skills and uh, to develop the applications. 
Now, I was going to save this for the end, but Ken has been teasing you by holding this phone up a couple <laughs> times. It's not what you think it is. Would you please tell everyone what it is, Ken, and show it to them? Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm not going to, 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 to make an advertising, but yeah, I do want to show you some, something really exciting. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is a normal phone. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, everybody has that, but uh, you know, we launched this uh, you know, foldable screen smartphone uh, last Friday in China. Now you can you know, uh, open it like a mini tablet, but it's not a you know, tablet, it's a phone. Because uh, when you fold it, yeah, you, it, it's so portable. And from my perspective, it's, it's not just a, a you know, normal phone, because with a bigger screen and with the 5G network, now it, I just mentioned that in, in just a, you know, one minute, you can download a high definition video into the phone, and then in, you can enjoy high definition video on the go with a bigger screen. And beyond that, for many different industries like the education, like, you know, manufacturing, you know, I, I believe that the developers will develop some very interesting applications on this bigger screen. Now, right now, this, this, is, this is the Mate X, and it retails for the equivalent of $2,600. So it's, it's very expensive. Yeah, it is. It to is. your other phones. Do you anticipate that this will become the dominant form factor, or will it remain an, an interesting niche product that it is today? Yeah, obviously, you know, um, the consumer um, is quite diversified. I would say that you know eventually we will have a pretty diversified portfolio for the you know smartphone, but I do believe that you know after using it for a couple of months, I do believe that the phone itself, I mean the foldable smartphone with the larger screen itself, is a killer application. Because when when we launch the new mobile services, we always talk about what's going to be the killers application, but I think the phone itself is a killer application because yeah. it's multitasking. You can use it to develop lots of brand new applications for different vertical industries, not just for gaming for the consumers, but for different vertical industries. And it's, it's obviously an engineering marvel. I've, I've held one, and if you see Ken later, you should try to get him to let you hold <laughs> it for a moment because it's, it's pretty neat. Now, Ken, this is the Fortune Global Forum, so we have a, Huawei has a a very small uh, infrastructure business in the United States, but no, almost no consumer almost, business almost a zero. in the United States. So yeah. how is the company uh, impacted from a business perspective from the U.S.-China trade tensions? Uh, yeah, as, as I just mentioned, you know, no business in the United States is quite limited, and we never gain any significant sales revenue from the U.S. So from the sales perspective, uh, U.S. is just a very, very small market for us, hmm. and globally now our, our business is uh, is running well. In the first, uh, three, uh, in the, in the past three quarters in this year, we achieved more than 20 percent, you know, revenue growth year over year, and our shipment of the smartphone and the, the uh, 5G equipment is also in a pretty good shape. However, the ongoing um, conflict. I mean, the trade conflict between the China and the U.S. do have an impact on our business, particularly on the supply chain, because, you know, we have to shift our supply chain from the U.S. to the rest of the world. And we as a company, we've been working with our U.S. suppliers for so many, so many, so many, many years. And, uh, you know, we uh, purchased 11 billion U.S dollars goods and services from the U.S. suppliers, and now we have to shift the supply chain over months. So in the past couple of months, we spent great effort on that, and we spent, you know, extra cost on that. Uh, yeah, let me share with you some, some of the figure. We anticipate that in the next three years, the supply from our European suppliers will increase by 60 percent. And I assume that the loose of the, the, the gain of the, 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 the Europe is the loss of the U.S., obviously. So, yeah, so as I just mentioned, you know, 11 billion in a year from the U.S., so that's a real impact on our U.S. suppliers as well. So it seems that, you know, some of them will, most of them will lose their business from Huawei. And uh, unfortunately, what I learned is that most of the suppliers are the small and the medium-sized companies. So I think, you know, the shift 
were not just a, a you know cost the extra, extra cost for Huawei, but also put risk for the for so many jobs in the U, U, U.S. and it's quite unfortunate and unfair to the employees of, of all those U.S. companies and their family members. So that's that's really unfortunate. Do you have any reason to be optimistic that that situation will turn around? Yeah, I don't see. Yeah, I, at this moment, I don't see anything, you know, optimistic. Because, uh, yeah, we've been doing a lot of things in the past a couple of years, past so many years, and we try what we can. However, it seems that, you know, yeah, the problem didn't, you know, uh, happen just now, but, yeah, and I believe that it, it won't, you know, finish. Uh, with this, you know, administration, so. Is there a question in the room for Ken? So, yes, please. Uh, we'll get a mic to you right away. Please stand up and identify yourself. Here it comes. I'm Shuni Ye from CSAB International. Uh, I have a question. I know there's the trade tension between U.S. and China. There have been a lot of talk, even this lunchtime, talk about de-link, decouple. But are they bring, are they area um, business and um, political leader could focus on principal engagement? Uh, would there be possibility to looking at a certain area, for example, for Huawei, still could continue the dialogue? and uh, looking for improvement. Is there something the government can do to, to, to help the situation? Yeah, be, yeah, before I talk about, you know, what the government and the business community can do, I'd like to share with you some figures in our industry. You know, now we're talking about the 5G. In our industry, you know, we uh, evolved from one, two, three, four, and then, and, and now to 5G. The 5G, is for the first time in the human history that we achieve a single global standard. You know, the innovation on the technology is so expensive nowadays. So we don't want to get back to the past generations. Now we're talking about the 6G. Yeah, we want to maintain a single global standard. That will greatly help us to reduce the cost of innovation and speed up the adoption of the new technologies to the world. So we hope that the politicians, the government, can understand the fact of technological innovation. Because here, we talk a lot about how to leverage the innovation to you know, grow the economy, to develop our society. So we should fundamentally understand the fact of innovation and to figure out you know, how to support the you know, global innovation. Ken, very last question uh, for me. Uh, your, your founder of Huawei, Chairman Ren, uh, made a proposal to the Western technology world that Huawei would license its technology if anyone wanted to take a license. No one has taken Huawei up on the offer. No company has taken Huawei up on the offer yet. Do you have a further suggestion? His idea was meant to diffuse the tension. Does Huawei have another idea if this one isn't going to work? Yeah, to be honest, it's quite hard for us to, you know, uh, deal with this situation with the U.S. because uh, we've been trying a lot, and uh, it doesn't work. So uh, now our strategy is just, is just, you know, to focus on to the to the to the rest of the world, and uh, yeah, we take seriously, you know, the security as uh, is a key consideration of business, and to work with the different governments like the European countries. Uh, for a you know uh, accepted solution to ser ser seriously address these you know uh, concerns, but for our business growth, we do have idea that you know yeah we have a broader view on the future on the next uh, you know decades, and we believe that we will catch up with the you know digital transformation as the you know huge opportunity, and that's our long term plan. Yeah, but, but for, for the U.S. to be honest, we, we are not able to develop a long term plan. But I do have a question to ask, because without strong innovation, without open competition, what's the long-term plan for the U.S.? Well, with that, Ken Hu of Huawei, thank you very much. Thank you.